Thank you for the word of God. Thank you for the Ballinger family being with us tonight in our service. What a blessing to see what you are doing in and through and with their lives. And Lord, I pray that you would continue to have your hand upon their ministry. You would meet their every need and give them much fruit for their labor. Help us to be faithful, to pray for them as we've heard tonight the importance of praying for our missionary brethren. Help us to pray for those who have accepted the call to go. And God, I pray you'd help us to be mindful of their needs, mindful of their battles, and mindful of what they will face. Those on deputation while they're on the road and those that are on the field while they plant churches and share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, I thank you for the family. I thank you for this church family. And I pray that you'd give us something that would help us tonight to be better fathers, husbands, wives, mothers, children, just better servants of the Lord. God, help us and give us something that we could take and put into practice in our daily living in the week to come. In Jesus' name, amen. And amen. You may be seated. As I was thinking about the family, I thought about these verses of Scripture, and sometimes when you look at these verses of Scripture, you don't normally think about them being verses of Scripture that maybe that would go for the family, but when I read this, I see that there's a lot of things that needs to be exercised within the home as well as within the church, because ultimately, that's what the church is. The church is just a, an accumulation, or it's made up of, of many homes. And so uh, as the homes go, so goes the church. And so when I thought about this, I, I went back and, and I, I looked at what Paul is saying to this church family. He's saying, you know, he said, you, there's just some things you ought to, uh, ought to do and there's some things you ought not to do. And if we're not careful, we'll just see the negatives. And let me show you what I'm talking about. And we'll get into it, the Lord willing, a little deeper uh, later on, whether it be tonight or, or further, we'll see. But look at verse 25, for example. Most people read verse 25 and they say, you know what? You ought to quit lying. And you should. <laughs> Amen. That's right. But that's not all Paul says in that verse. He doesn't only talk about lying. He talks about speaking the truth. He talks about lying. He does. And there's, listen, we ought not to lie. And you would think writing to a church, and that is who Paul was addressing this letter to, that he wouldn't have to say that. And yet, because of some previous scripture, we find that even after you get saved, the old Adamic nature stays with you. And because the Adamic nature is there, and because we're, we're tempted, and because we, we allow the flesh to have the victory sometimes in our lives, then we will find ourselves in some form or another, if we're not careful, lying. Lying. And we're going to talk about that in just a moment. But if you'll look, he didn't say just stop lying. He said start telling the truth, right? You see, the Bible rarely tells us to stop doing something without telling us to start doing something in its place, right? It, it, there, there's a lot of things when you get saved that, that'll change, but you don't just leave that void because if you do, it's apt to come back. And so you have to fill that void with something else. Now, the first thing that the apostle does, and I want you to go back into verse number 17, and, and, and this is just my opinion, okay? And I don't give you my opinion much. But in my opinion, this is the most dark description of a lost man in all the Bible. Look at what Paul says here. Paul said in verse number 17, this I say, therefore. Now, you see that word? Now, why does Paul use this word? He uses this word over and over in his writings, therefore and wherefore. Now, why? Because the Bible is not just to be studied so we can have a knowledge. The Bible is to be obeyed. And so when you see the word therefore, and, and just for example, look in chapter 4, verse 1. I, therefore. Look in chapter 1, in verse number 17. This I say, or chapter 4, I'm sorry, chapter 4, verse 1, I therefore, chapter 4, verse 17, this I say, 
therefore. Look in verse number 25 of chapter number 4. Wherefore, chapter 5, verse 1, be ye therefore. Chapter 5 and verse number 7, be not ye therefore. Look down, if you would, in verse number 14 of chapter 5. Wherefore, chapter 5, verse 24, therefore. What's Paul doing here? As he does in his other epistles, he's saying, look, God just doesn't want you to learn something. God wants you to do something with what you've learned. James put it this way, but be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. And so when you see this word therefore and wherefore, what Paul was saying is God has taught you something so that you can take that truth and put it into practice in your life, not just so you can talk about what you know. There's so, so many people that are walking around, well, I know this, and I, you can't even talk to folks anymore. They'll, they'll just interrupt you while you're talking. Well, I know, I know. Listen, brother, I'm not concerned about what you know. I'm concerned about what you're doing with what you know. Amen. We, we've just gotten to the place in, in our culture, in our society in America today, where, where we think that what we know makes us something. Can I tell you that what we know about this book right here makes us accountable? It makes us accountable because to much that is given, to much is required. And so Paul said, I'm telling you this so you can put it into practice. Therefore, you need to do this. Therefore, you need to do that. Wherefore, you need to put this into practice. You see what Paul's saying here? And so he goes in verse number uh, 17 of chapter 4. He said, this I say therefore. Now, what he's telling these Believers here in Ephesus is, hey, you were dead in your trespasses and sin. And I'm going back in some previous chapters now, and I'm working my way up. He's been saying, hey, there was a time when you were afar off from Christ. You were dead in your trespasses and sin. But God, who is rich in mercy, has done something in your life. But he didn't just do something in your life so you could have a knowledge of it and so you could be a trophy he did it so you would live different and show people that the power of God and the grace of God makes a difference in somebody's life. You know, in our homes, if we're not careful, this will be the place where it's, it's missing the most. It's amazing how that we can be gracious and we can show things at church, but really, you want to know a lot about a person, just follow them around home, <laughs> Right? See, I could ask a lot of you men tonight, how's, how's things going with your life? And you would tell me, oh, it's great. I, I'm, I'm about perfect, about that close to perfect. But if I ask your wife, you won't be, the, <laughs> you better be about that close to disaster. Right? You see what I'm saying? So, so well, what, is, what is Paul saying here? He's saying God saved you to make you something. As a matter of fact, if you go back just for a moment to chapter 1, there's this phrase that Paul keeps using, that if we Christians could get, just get a hold of this, brethren, if we could just get a hold of it, in our homes, in the workplace, in the church, in all that we do, if we could just get a hold, this is why God saved me. Why did God save you? So, well, preacher, God saved me to keep me out of hell. Well, that's, hey, that's a benefit that comes with it. Praise God. Amen. And we're going to heaven. Say, people, we just sang it. When we all get to heaven. Not if we all get to heaven. If you're saved, you're going to heaven. Say amen now. If you're saved, you're going to heaven. It's not a matter if you get there. The grace of God is going to see us home, brethren. It's going to see us home. We're going home by way of the cross. Now, we're saved. Notice what he said in chapter 1, verse number 6. To the praise of the glory of his grace. I had that underlined in my Bible. To the praise of the of the glory of His grace. Verse 6. Look if you would in verse number 12. That we should be to the praise of His glory. So that's what God saves us for. God, God saves us so that men would praise Him. So that men can see the grace of God in a person's life and, and praise God for it. Look if you would in, in chapter 1 in verse number 14. Look at that last verse. Unto the praise of His glory. You see... Paul keeps using that phrase, unto the praise of his glory, unto the praise of his glory, unto the praise of his glory. When people look at your life as a Christian, and when people look at my life as a Christian, they ought to praise God. 
and say, what a, what a difference God has made in Dale Freeman's life. What a difference God has made in Corey Cooper's life. My, how God has changed Calvin Dean's life. Have you seen, have you noticed what God has done in David Oliver's life? Hey, when people look at our lives, they ought to do it to the praise of the glory of God. So that's why we're saved. Now, if you look at chapter 4, in verse 17, Paul is talking about, well, you know, you were dead in your trespasses and sin. And I want you to notice how he describes a lost man here. This is... This is one of the most detailed, darkest, but truest definitions of a lost man in all the Bible. Look at verse 17. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk. Now, there's a lot of positives in the Bible, but there's some negatives too. And the Bible tells us there's just some things we ought not to do. Now, generally speaking, this is what Paul is saying here. You shouldn't walk the way you walked before you got saved. You shouldn't be known as a Gentile anymore, a pagan. He said in another place, you shouldn't even be known as a Jew anymore, a religious person. For in the body of Christ, there's neither Jew nor Gentile. You shouldn't be known for the, the old man. Amen? You shouldn't be known for that. You should be known for the new man. And he takes up this conversation again in verse 22 when he says you ought to put off the former conversation of the old man. You see that? And then he says in verse 24 that you put on the new man. So he said, you know, as a Christian, there's just some things that you should do and some things you shouldn't do. And so he said here, generally speaking, You just shouldn't walk as other Gentiles walk. When God saved you, that means change comes in your life. There's just some things that go on in our homes, brethren, that shouldn't go on any longer. When you get saved, there's just some things in your home that should begin to kind of phase out. Right? The drinking. The smoking. The cursing. The lying. The cheating. The gambling. The wrong kind of music. The wrong kind of programming. There's just some things that ought to phase out as God begins to complete that work in our lives as we begin to grow in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We ought to be being more and more conformed to God's Son, Jesus Christ. This is what makes our families what God intends them to be. This is what helps us not to bicker and argue, and fuss, and fight, right? Boy, how how our homes would improve if we would just follow this one simple little admonition of the Apostle Paul. Look at what he said here now in, in the latter part of verse number 17. He said, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk. Your home shouldn't be like the lost neighbor's home, brother. My home shouldn't be like... the the lost neighbors. Amen. Amen. There's just a a, a way of life that we as Christians should set an example. Now, notice what he said about the way that the Gentiles walk. The lost man. What's he say about it? He said, first of all, he said that they walk in, in a mental darkness. Look at what he said here. He said, they walk in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened. And then he said not only that, he said there's like this this emotional hardness because they're alienated from the life of God through ignorance. So there's this darkness and then there's this ignorance from the life of God. They they have no clue. They, They don't know where they're going. They don't even know where they come from. And then he said this, In verse number 18, he closed it out. He said, because of the blindness of their heart. Now, you think about those statements that Paul just made. He said in the latter part of verse number 17, he talked about vanity, emptiness, no purpose. What a terrible way to go through life. Vanity. 
That word means empty, no purpose, the vanity of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. And now look what it leads to. It's, a, it's like a callousness. It, it, he said in verse number 19, who being past feeling. Would you underline that in your Bible? Who being past feeling. Some of you still know what it's like to lose sleep because of your sin. Say, preacher, I, hope, I wish I didn't have to lose sleep when I do wrong. You better thank God that the Spirit of God keeps you up in the wee hours of the morning because of wrongdoing in your life. I thank God for that kind of sensitivity, don't you? I don't ever want to lose that, brethren. I don't want to ever lose the sensitivity to sin and to the Holy Ghost of God. I want to remain sensitive to God because there can come a place and a time. And Paul feared this. Paul feared this. He even warned against people's conscience being seared with a hot iron. He said here in verse number 19, who being past feeling have given themselves over into lasciviousness, unbridled, unrestrained lust, no restraint in their life, no restraint whatsoever. That's what Paul's saying. Well, you know, these people in Ephesus were being taken on a trip back into yesteryear when they were without God and without hope. Sometimes it does us good to go back B.C., doesn't it? And to think about where God found us and the condition that He found us in when He bestowed His grace on us. And look at what God has done in our lives. Oh, yes, there's work to do. But thank God from where He's brought us from to where we are. And Paul's reminding this church here, he's saying, you know, you think you have problems now. If we're not careful, we'll become so accustomed to the grace and the goodness of God We'll begin to complain about our life as it is, and we'll forget how life was before Jesus. Amen. And so in your home, you may look around and you may say, well, you know what, we don't have this or it's not all that, but thank God it's not what it used to be before Jesus. Amen? Amen. And Paul's reminding these people in Ephesus of this. I need to be reminded of this from time to time, and I believe if you would be honest with yourself, you need to be reminded as well. And so Paul's reminding them, and he said in verse number 19, who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness, which means unbridled, unrestrained lust, to work all uncleanness with greediness. Now what does that mean? That means it's all about self. Greediness. I just, I'm going to do what I want to do. I'm not going to take into account of how it affects anybody. I'm going to please me, and I'm going to do what I'm going to do. Paul said, remember when your life was about you instead of about him? And again, sometimes it just does us good, brethren. What's Paul doing here? He's reminding these people that before Jesus came to you, this was your life. Why? Because he's getting ready to tell them their responsibility now as a Christian. And that's what I want to share with you in just a few moments that I have left here. So he said, here's what you should do. Realizing where God found you. This condition here in verse 17, 18, and 19, this is the condition that God found all of us, brethren. If you're saved, now listen to me. If you're saved in the grace of God, this is where God found you. Amen? Right here, brethren. This is where God finds all sinners. Right here. And then he said this in verse number 20. But ye have not so learned Christ. Amen. God's going to work in your life. As a matter of fact, when you go through here, you'll see a lot of things about the mind. I'm just going to point out a few things because this is where it began. Now, there's a lot of discussion about repentance. And I'm not preaching tonight on repentance, though it needs to be preached because there's a lot of people trying to leave repentance out of salvation. And Jesus said in Luke 13, 3 and 5, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Amen. Repentance is absolutely essential Amen. to salvation. Amen. 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 But there's this, this kind of battle, this theological discussion. What is repentance? Well, I think it begins with the change of mind. Now, I'm not saying that's where it ends. But there's a change. It's a change of mind. I believe it's a change of heart. I believe it's a change of will. I believe when you study the prodigal son, you find that repentance was active in his life in all of those areas. But notice what Paul does here with this word. Look, if you would, in verse number 17. And the last, the last word there is mind. 
Then if you would, in verse number 18, having the understanding. See, that's dealing with the mind. Don't lose me now. Look, look at what he said here in verse number 18. Alienated from the life of God through the what? Ignorance. See, that's dealing with the mind. What's Paul saying? He's saying these people don't have God in their mind. Their mind. Look, look, he went on and said it again in verse number 20. Ye have not so learned. That deals with the mind. And then you look at verse number, uh, I think it's verse 23. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. What's Paul saying here? Just what I was preaching this morning. You need to do some thinking. We're living in a culture that doesn't think much. A lot of talking, no thinking. You know what the Bible calls that? Prating. Prating. You need to look that word up. It's a good Bible word that's used in the book of Proverbs. A lot of prating. A lot of talking, no thinking. We need to be thinking people. We need to think things through. There's a, no saying that a lot of elderly people use think before you speak. I need to put that to practice more. How about you? Right? Watch well, I could have saved myself a lot of unnecessary heartache if I would have just put that one little principle to place in my life. Just think before you speak. Think before you act. Think it through. See, the devil will show you the start of something, but you need to think it through so you can see the end of it. Right? Boy, it looks good. I think I'm going to do it. Wait a minute. Hold it. It looks good from here. But now you think that thing through and what's on the back side of it, and it'll probably have a warning flag saying, don't do that. Many times, right? So the mind. Let me give you, a, there's a lot in here. So let me just give you a couple of principles and I'll, I'll, I'll be through tonight, okay? I'm not going to go in detail in this. There's a lot of good teaching here that's going to help us in our personal life and in our homes. We need help, brethren. We need help. The fabric of the American home is coming unraveled to where now anything goes. But there ought to be some guidelines and some parameters. There ought to be some principles, just some things that we, we have made up our mind. We're not going there. We're not going to allow that to happen by the grace of God. So where does it start? Well, Paul said it starts with you. And with me, it starts with me. Now, men, listen to me. We are the priest of our homes. Amen. Men, listen to me. God has made you the priest of your home, the high priest. And God has responsibilities for every member of the family. And we'll be discussing those. And Paul begins to discuss them in the next chapter over in chapter 5. But he's setting up right here. Because he's saying you need to remember where God found you. And you need to apply some general principles in your home so that you can fulfill the role that God has given you. Oftentimes when we want to talk about the home, we just jump over to chapter number 5 and we just start right there at verse 22 and most men don't even get out of verse number 22. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands. Amen. Right here says it, honey. Submit. Right? And a woman should submit to her husband. And that shouldn't make you nervous. That shouldn't make you angry. That shouldn't make you feel left out. That's your role. Amen. But a man ought to love his wife like Christ loved the church too. But before we ever get to these roles, it's got to start right here. And it starts where, in verse number 17, we, we can't walk as other Gentiles walk. You, we just can't do that. You can't bring that baggage over into this new life. You're a new creature. Old things got to pass away, brother. There's got to be some new things. Whose responsibility is that? You say, well, preacher, the Holy Ghost lives in me. You better thank God he does because it's not going to happen without him. But I'll tell you this, even with his help, as we heard tonight from Brother Ballinger, listen, God uses us as a tool. Look at what he said here in verse number 22. That, what's that next word? Ye, that ye put off. 
It's my responsibility to die daily. I've got to die to self. That's what he's saying here. That you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust. Dale Freeman, you've got to die to that old self. You've got to die to that old Adamic nature. You're dead. You should be crucified with Christ. We're dead with him. In baptism, isn't that what it says in, in, in Romans 6? We're buried with him, brethren. You know what? The funniest, and it's not really funny, it's just strange. The strangest thing, I keep, I keep coming back alive. <laughs> I kill myself, and, and, and the old man jumps out of the grave the next day, Brother Terry. I mean, it's just something. Has that ever happened to you? <laughs> hey, man, you kill yourself. Sometimes the day don't even get through. The old man jumps out of the grave again. There he is. Oh, preacher, I have to deal with that. I killed myself about 20 years ago, and I'm, I'm done with it. Wow, I need to see you after the service. Why, are you going to get some spiritual advice? No, I'm going to give you a mental evaluation. <laughs> or a lie detector test, amen. <laughs> hey, Paul said, you've got you've to die to yourself now. Amen. You've got to get that old man out of the way. You're never going to make any spiritual progress. Now, hear me now. The Holy Ghost of God's not going to run roughshod over your old man. You, me, we've got to get him out of the way. Isn't that what he said right here? He said that ye put off concerning the former conversation of the old man. And it's a battle, brethren. It's a battle, but it's a choice too. And it's a choice that every one of us must make. We've got to make it in our family. We have to make it in the workplace. We have to make it in our, our church ministry. We just have to make it in life. He said in verse number 23, he said, you've got to be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Now, what's he mean? I, I don't have time to go into this. We're going to take that one phrase right there and, and, and talk about it, just a whole message. But I do want to tell you this. The Bible teaches, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Now, physically, you are what you eat. Spiritually, you are what you think. And I'm going to say that again. Physically, you are what you eat. Whatever, listen, the Bible teaches this. Whatever you put in your body, brother, that's what, hey, that's going to affect the way you go about in your physical being. Hey, it's not going to matter to me, preacher. I'm just going to load up on carbs and this and that. Yeah, I know I am too. But you're going to suffer for it because you are what you eat, right? Physically. But spiritually, the Bible says we are what we think. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Thinking is very important. The Bible has a lot to say about our minds, brethren. A lot. He said, you've got to be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And then you've, you've got, in other words, when you get saved, God just gives you a whole new way of life. Remember when you first got saved, how things just, I mean, it's just amazing. I don't know, I just began to notice the things of God. It's, it's like my spiritual senses came alive. The, some things that I never even noticed before, I, I began to notice little things. It's, it, and it's because my spiritual senses did come alive. I was quickened. That's what happens when you get saved. And then God begins to work. And then he says, now, what you've got to do is God begins to give you that renewed mind. Look at verse 24. You've got to put on the new man. Now, I want you to underline a word in your Bible in verse number 24. And that you put on the new man, that next word is not uh, which after God, not by God. Okay? He said that you put on the new man which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Now, he didn't say that by God, though it is by God because it's his divine nature. All right? The new man is God's divine nature. When we get saved, according to 2 Peter chapter 1, verse number 4, we become partakers of the divine nature. Is that what the Bible says, brethren? Absolutely. And so, in other words, we're to become like God. We're to become after God. Righteousness in the way that we deal with men. Holiness in the way that we deal with God. We're to treat man right. And we're to treat God as God. Can I tell you something? 
One of the grand, grandest days in my life is when I came to the realization, this is just very simple, but I'm very simple. One of the grandest days of my life was when I realized God is God and I am not. You say, preacher, uh, how long did it take you to realize that? Longer than I wanted it to. But I'm glad for the day that I got that settled. I don't tell God what to do. I'm not in charge. God is. I'm his servant. Amen. I, I, I'm part. He, I'm his creation. He's the creator. And so he said, now because of this, you got to put off and you have to put on. And that's when he gets into that section. And that's, we'll elaborate on it. But I want to give you something to take home with you. Take this home with you. And I want you to look at it. We'll discuss it in detail. Look, if you would, in verse number 25. He said, now, you know what you ought to start doing in your home, Dale Freeman? You ought to start telling your family, we're going to quit lying. You say, well, preacher, we don't lie. Well, wait a minute. You might have just did. <laughs> Remember, think. Think. Lying can take on a lot of forms. All right? See, some people exaggerate and they don't think it's a lie. That's a lie. Some people make a promise not keep it. That's a lie. All right? We're going to talk about what is involved in this word lie. And he said you ought to put it away. Now, see, that's what you do with the old man. So with the old man, you've got to put away that old man, which is going to put away the lie. Now you've got to put on something. What's that? The truth. See, so you see, in verse 22, you've got to put off the old man. But you've got to put on the new man. So you put off, put away lying. What do you do, verse number 25? You speak truth, every man with his neighbor. What's Paul saying? We owe it to every man to be truthful with him. We're indebted to tell the truth to people. But it's, especially who? What did he say, brother? Especially your church family. Right? What would it be like? If your brain lied to your arm or your eye lied to your feet. Paul said, hey, we're members of one another. And if we start sending wrong signals, things are going to get dysfunctional in a hurry. And so he said, don't lie, but tell the truth. Then he said this in verse number 26, don't be angry, do be angry, but don't sin. In other words, there is a right kind of anger and a wrong kind of anger. Can I tell you, it's about time for some Christians to get angry about some things. Say amen now. Amen. There's just some things that we ought to be angry about. It's called righteous indignation. Now, there's some things that we can't allow anger to, to take over because he said in verse number uh, 26, he said, if you get that kind of angry, you don't let the sun go down on your wrath now. That's the wrong kind of anger. There is a right kind. What kind is that, preacher? It's the anger that you don't sin. Isn't that what he said? That's what he said. Be angry. Sin not. You say, can you be angry and not sin? Well, sure you can. Sure you can. God's been wroth, and he's never sinned. Never. Look at verse 28. Let him that stole steal no more. Quit stealing. You say, well, you shouldn't have to tell Christians to quit stealing. But it depends on what you think stealing is. If the place you work says you get a 15-minute break and you take a 17-minute break, you just stole two minutes of that company's time. Yeah. We have to be careful, don't we? I, yeah, you know, somebody gave you a little extra change. Well, it was just 50 cent extra. Don't take somebody else's money now. Take that 50 cent back and give it to them. Say, hey, you gave me too much change. Right? Let him that steals, let him that stole steal no more, but what? But let him labor, working with his uh, hands, the things which is good that he may have to give to others. So quit stealing and start sharing. Isn't that what he's saying? So you thought God gave you that extra so you could keep it, but the Bible teaches that God will give you extra so you can share it. That's what he said. Right? Amen. By the way, I'm going to put a plug in for Faith Promise since we have missionary guests tonight. Sometimes God will give us our Faith Promise, and if we're not careful, we'll think it's for God. God gave it to us for us to spend on ourselves, and God, that's our Faith Promise. <laughs> Amen. So you be careful. Not everything extra that God sends your way is for you. Sometimes God will give through you what God will not give to you. And we need to remember that. Then I'll close with this. Verse 29. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. That's the negative. You put that off. That word corrupt 
It's the same word that Jesus used when he talked about an a, a evil tree bringing forth corrupt fruit. Just rotten. You know, rotten stuff ought not come out of your mouth. You're a believer now. You're a Christian. And so he said, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use. And here's, here's the, the, what we ought to put on. Speech that edifies and that ministers and that is gracious. Isn't that what he said? So he said, you know, just put some things off and then put some things on. Quit telling lies and start telling the truth. Quit blowing up about everything and got to have your way. There's, this, there's some righteous indignation, right? If you're going to be angry, be angry about the right things and the right temperament. Don't steal. Share. That's God's way. See, that's the new man. Stealing's the old man. Got to get rid of that. Got to get the new, new man. What's that, preacher? It's sharing. It's sharing. Corrupt communication, slander, filthy jokes, off-color, inappropriate language. That shouldn't be named among one of us who professes to be saved. We ought to have speech that edifies, which means build up and ministers to people. And it's gracious. Paul wrote in the book of Colossians that our speech ought to be with grace, seasoned with salt. Right? How you doing? How are we doing when Paul's giving this checklist? He's saying, hey, we want to talk to you about being husbands and wives and children and servants over in chapter 5 and 6. He said, but before I do, I want to give a little test here. See, generally, how are we doing? Are we walking as Gentiles? Are we, have we allowed the old man to jump back out of the grave and become dominant and have a place in our life? Have, or we put him off and put on the new man? It's something that we have to do daily. Isn't it? It is. Let's stand.